Mary, thank you so much for taking time to do this today and what I know is a very, very busy time for you. I'd like to start by just asking you a few questions. The first one is, what event or beliefs or in your youth led you to become the activist that you are? I'll say a couple of things. One is just, I think the values on which I was nurtured about caring about all human beings, this is a family thing um, and a faith thing. Um, certainly mattered, particularly the whole line of liberty and justice for all is something that stuck in my head. And I don't think I'm alone in that regard. So those are sort of like some more atmospheric things. But for whatever reasons, I just always noticed the ways in which people were treated differently. Love my family, but like I was the only girl with three brothers. And, you know, there was just a way in which there were the girl things and the boy things. And they got to do the interesting things. Um you know, at school, the both the gender and the racial dynamics were very evident to me. I went to public schools. There were kids like me who, you know, always got the smiles from the teachers, and there were kids who didn't, and it was painful. Um, you know, and some kids were like the problems, and you know, what can I say it broke down a lot around lines of race, and it broke down on lines of, I just think, economic resources. Um, and I didn't come from a wealthy family, just by the way, at all, but still you could see it. And I had, you know, my whiteness to compensate, I guess. Um, so I just always noticed those things. And I got my first, like, like actual job. I was working in a grocery store, loved it. It was a really big grocery store. It was sort of like a multi-department store before there was such a thing, really. It was a grocery store that had all these other departments. And I worked at the front end, which is where everybody checks stuff out and loved it. Loved it, loved the people I was working with. You know, a lot of the full timers, you know, were, you know, these honestly mostly incredibly competent women who, for whatever reasons, didn't have a lot of chances in life and loved them, loved working with them. And then while I was there, I think as a cost cutting measure, um, the entity decided to like downsize these full timers to part time, which would also cut their benefits. And it was catastrophic for them. And experience is catastrophic at the front end, you know, in terms of what this would mean for people's lives. You know, I started thinking about unions, like, anyway, I just sort of noticed these things and really was getting, I think, most sentient beings sort of kind of get, like, that not everybody is treated the same. And it really rubbed against the grain for me. I also realized that there was probably a reason I felt so different in the world, you know, being lesbian, and I hadn't really been able to name that really until I was in college. I really, that liberty and justice thing, I can poke fun at it. I'm sorry, but like those are liberty and justice are good values. <laughs> Freedom and opportunity are good values. And I really, um, when I was experiencing that sort of complete transformation of how other people regarded me, um, you know, into suddenly being more of an outcast, you know, it was really instructive. And I was very clear this was this is going to be work that I did however I did it, whether it was going to be focused as I initially was focused very much on, you know, just material resources and people being able to have food and housing and um, healthcare and that kind of thing, but then in safety anyway, but eventually um, when I had the opportunity, I decided to go full time into the LGBTQ rights world at a time when it was considered a career killer. But uh, if it meant killing my career to do justice work, I was okay with that. In this time, really challenging time, what continues to motivate you to be an activist or what guides you, what gives you courage? You know, a great many things um, that from which I draw inspiration, maybe even courage. You know, in law, we have faced a lot of opposition. There have been a lot of structural barriers and there remain structural and systemic barriers in various places that are also just blatant inequalities in the law. Um, you get to do X and you do not, you know, when it comes to LGBT people. And part of me just had to really reconcile feeling like I was advocating a minority position, but damn it, I was right. And would try to fortify myself by saying like, Mary, you were right. What you were talking about is liberty and justice for all. And you were talking about stuff that's in the constitution. You were talking about principles in the constitution. So hang in there and like, you're right, you're right, you're right. Um, I, but beyond all of that, like I will say that um, one of the great things about the work that I've done is it does bring me into contact with many people within my own organization, um, but certainly well beyond it with other organizations and also in the public because 
you know, any minority group um, only succeeds when it's allied with others. Um, you just simply don't have the numbers to like force the change you want. And, you know, of course the LGBT community is incredibly, you know, diverse and multifaceted. You can be an LGBT person born into any family in any circumstances. And that's a strength. And it's been a great and ongoing learning experience for me, as well as I think a source of strength for our community and our work to be informed by multi-generational voices and perspectives. They don't always all harmonize. And that's as it should be. Um, that's okay. Um, but a lot to learn and to sort of anchor the advocacy, anchor um, in people's lives and lived experiences, the work that we do. It has given me courage because I see constantly that many people in different walks of life are willing to put themselves out there and share, share their truth. Um, and not only that, but sometimes to listen to points of view with which they disagree and to think about how to find common ground nonetheless, because I think people don't always focus on the fact that, you know, those of us who are in these positions right now are always, you know, striding, struggling with a battle of like people trying to repress mm -hmm. us versus us trying to find a seat at the table and the same constitutional protections and et cetera, freedom and opportunity as others. And that means you have to persuade people to to see you and to be able to hear you and to reassure them to some degree. And I know it's not the most glamorous part of the work, but it's actually in some ways the work of our democracy. Um, is that engagement with other people, including those with whom we disagree? That has given me courage is to see the ways in which people do that and get out of their comfort zones. Um, and I'll give you an example from, from Massachusetts for a minute. So when we won this marriage case, the first marriage case from the state Supreme Court in 2003, you know, the powers that be initially um, and forcefully um, began attempts to try to amend the state constitution to undo the law. And those proceedings ultimately extended for three years and various efforts. But one of the things in the very first constitutional convention proceedings that just took my breath away was a woman who was a state senator who had been on the opposite side of everything that I stood for, except poverty work, you know, was really not a friend. And she stood up and she said at this convention proceeding when they were talking about taking away this decision and this protection that was going to be extended for the first time to same-sex couples, she said, this decision is absolutely outside of my comfort zone and this decision is absolutely correct. Wow. And it is not for me to use my comfort zone as the measure of my constituents' constitutional rights. And suffice it to say, that began a journey for her and I think for many other people to face down then the, the amount of you know pushback she received and to make alliances with people, to learn you can make alliances with people who didn't always agree with you. Um, I, and I've taken that lesson to heart. So what advice do you have for youth activists? No, it's not for me to give advice but I am going to make a few just observations if I can. One is, these are really hard times, and I really want to acknowledge that. The same forces are out there, but they're magnified, you know, through the use of social media and disinformation and the, the loss of integrity, really, in some of our systems, even though our systems need to change. Things are very challenging, and I recognize that. Really, really challenging. But I think in this kind of in this environment, it is super important to remember that a person can make a difference. A group of people can make a difference. I think it was Margaret Mead who said something like, it's the only thing that ever has made a difference, right? It was people coming together. And so when it comes to voting or it comes to political participation, it's super easy to be cynical and to say nothing happens. But I think the one way to make sure you get discounted is not participating. And the one way to make sure you do get counted and start to have some influence is by participating and engaging. Um, doesn't mean that it's easy. And for me, like I'm not a patient person at all, but I have this idea of being impatiently patient, which makes me push harder to say like, no, things aren't okay the way that they are, even though it's going to take time to steer things in a different direction, to build the confidence of, you know, help support and build the confidence of people who whose voices really need to be heard, ending the dehumanization of people for one reason or another. Those are things that don't happen overnight, but they can happen. And I've seen them happen. 
and I believe they can still happen. So I guess I would say, please try to hang in there. Try to think about ways that you feel okay about trying to participate. That's one thing. The other thing I just want to say is, and this comes from my experience um, as a lawyer, we necessarily necessarily have to look backwards about precedents. You have to know where you've come from to know the sort of things that should be settled and <laughs> where you're going. Um, and, you know, in that regard, it's like just really true. And I'm also, you know, studied history and still do. And there's pendulums, okay? We're in a bad place in a pendulum right now. And it doesn't mean it's always going to be this way. And I think the way that pendulums shift is because people engage. Um, so if there's ever a time to engage, it's certainly now. The last thing I guess I want to say about this is it's a time when it's so easy to feel mad and frustrated and like you don't count. And I get all of that. And it's time to like meet the other side where they are and be in the mud with them, push back. And I get that. And I, at the same time, want to say like, what will inspire us and what will bring greater strength to what we are trying to accomplish with liberty and justice for all, with truth, is by articulating a positive vision of what we're fighting for and not just what we're fighting against. I can't tell you how persuasive that is to people when they see that there's some rational people at the table who are really speaking about values that actually embrace all of us. Um, that's a powerful thing. And it reminds me also of just a very deliberate choice that I made during the early days of winning um, marriage in Massachusetts, where suffice it to say, like the invective coming at me and others was pretty intense. I had argued the case. Um, I remained, you know, deeply involved in these issues. And I just made a decision that I was not going to get down there in the gutter. I was not going to do it. And I have stuck with that decision over the years to try not to always assume the worst about somebody to try to create the possibility where there is connection. I get it that there are some people that make it super hard to do that, but I don't want to give up on anybody, not even close, including people who disagree with me. And so I just want to say, like, if you're fighting for your common humanity, which I feel like so many of us are still, and are, you know, equal stature and citizenship under the constitution, citizenship being, you know, a broad term here, when you're fighting for your common humanity, you cannot degrade the common humanity of others because it brings you down too. Anyway, everybody gets to make their own choices and there's definitely really important to get angry and to be able to vent and so on and so forth. But like we all have a job to do here um, for ourselves and for our communities and for the future, trying to move this ball forward um, of freedom of opportunity, of liberty and justice for all. What we do in part is make sure that, you know, our staff is increasingly diverse with lots of different people. And again, those people can all have the same perspective, but they mostly don't um, about issues and to have some time for cross fertilization of ideas, um, even though it's a legal organization and policy organization, and that's going to give some greater weight to people. But anyway, it's it's the idea of being in community um the people who don't all look and think like you, who don't all have necessarily the same um, degrees and background. Um, so that is part of it. And the other thing I would just say is, like, tell me a community in which there's not LGBTQ people. Tell me, like, about the LGBTQ community, what communities are not also part of that, that it would be considered other silos. So for years now, we've been talking about one justice movement, trying to live up to those broader principles you know, the difficulty is lots of attacks um, on LGBTQ young people in particular, um, which are really a stalking horse for broader things. How do we do that and at the same time make sure that we're there on voting rights and on democracy? Um, make sure we're there um, for, you know, Supreme Court potentially trying to strip away uh, protections for um, tribal and indigenous populations vis-a-vis -vis children. Um, how do we do all of it? So I think, again, you know, to the extent that there are tables and we are certainly part of them, um, some of them and always more, there's always room for more to get the perspectives and figure out how to work together. You know, with the Supreme Court decision on abortion, there have been some very productive collaborations. There always have been, but even more so 
with great with um, reproductive justice groups um, about how to make sure healthcare is available for people in states that want to provide it, whether it's you know reproductive healthcare or whether it's you know, affirming healthcare. We are only limited by our creativity and our finitude. Um, but when you have a bunch of motivated people, the finitude sometimes works itself out. Great. Thank you so much, Mary. I really appreciate you taking time today on a very busy moment for all of us. But um, thank you. It's been wonderful chatting with you.